30th of June, 1908, 7.14 a.m. local time, Siberia. The region of Tunguska sees the biggest explosion in human history. In one hour, the explosion and the great fire that followed destroy a region of forest the size of Greater London. People who observed that thought the end of the world had come, judgment day, divine intervention. They say that the Tunguska explosion had the force of more than 1,000 Hiroshimas. Millions of pine trees, larches and birches are destroyed by the pressure wave and the fires. A shock wave circles the world, leaving its mark on seismographs everywhere but no one can understand where it has come from. It is 20 years before Soviet scientists discover the true scale of the disaster and record it on film. Tunguska, as mysterious as the legend of Atlantis, or the sinister Bermuda Triangle. Few historical phenomena have caused so much speculation as this one day in the isolated Siberian forests. An expedition to Tunguska is a journey into the craziest theories and into serious scientific inquiry, the birth and deconstruction of a modern legend. Scientists from many different countries and disciplines are working to find the solution to the puzzle. What happened? For there is still no conclusive evidence and any number of interpretations. Was a meteorite the cause of this terrible destruction, as most scientists believe? But then there would be a crater, and no crater has ever been found. Or was it something quite different? The theory of a UFO crash won't go away. There are several versions. Theory 42. The Dropa UFO. In the Bayakara Yula Mountains live the diminutive Dropa people, descendants of an extraterrestrial race that crashed landed on Earth many centuries ago. In 1908, their home planet mounted a rescue mission. Unfortunately, the rescue UFO crashed over the harsh taiga landscape. The Dropa still hope one day their people will make an Earth-proof spacecraft. There's so little evidence. It's the lack of hard, solid evidence that makes these theories popular. Benny Pizer is a cultural anthropologist. He teaches at John Moore's University in Liverpool. His specialty is natural disasters and how people cope with them. The Tunguska uh, disaster changed our view of the world and our place in the cosmos because until then we thought that we were basically very protected, that the universe worked like clockwork and that nothing dramatic would happen. But in fact, we now know since Tunguska that we are potentially at the center of cosmic impacts and they have happened in the past and they might happen in the future. Imagine the Tunguska blast happening over Frankfurt. If a Tunguska-sized object were to detonate over a large city, the entire metropolitan area would be devastated and hundreds of thousands of people would be killed. A new generation of Earth scientists feel the same, like geologist Christoph Brenneisen. Würde es sich um einen Meteoriten gehandelt haben und die Erde hätte sich ein bisschen weiter gedreht, er hätte Petersburg vernichtet, eine Stunde später hätte er Helsinki vernichtet, eine Stunde später Stockholm und dann auch Oslo. Alle diese großen Städte liegen auf einem Breitengrad. 
Und das hat zur Folge, dass man natürlich schon ein bisschen darüber nachdenken muss, was kann da eigentlich mal so passieren. It was this burning question that first took Christoph Brenneisen from his castle in Germany to the Siberian Tiger in the year 2000 as part of a joint Russian-German expedition. Now he's on his way back to Tunguska to compare the main theories. If it really was a meteorite, he should be able to find material from outer space from soil tests near the epicenter of the explosion. Until now, no such material has been found. Christoph painstakingly notes the likeliest places to search. Maybe his homemade maps will guide him to a great discovery. They depict one of the most isolated regions on Earth. Beautiful, inaccessible and unforgiving. In 1928, Russian mineralogist Leonid Kulik was the first scientist to lead an expedition into what was then a disaster area. His pioneering work is still the basis for all later research. In those days, this territory was even wilder than it is today. No one went there if he didn't have to. Over two decades, Kulik and his men tried hard to find evidence for a meteorite impact. Herr Kulik ist mit Flugzeugen dieses ganze Gebiet abgeflogen und hat peinlich genau alles kartiert. Er hat ja noch jeden Baumstamm einzeln aufzeichnen können, der so lag, wie ihn die Explosion umgeworfen hat. Und mit diesen Daten ist es normalerweise ein leichtes, nachzuweisen, wo ein Meteorit niedergegangen ist. Leonid Kulik used all the latest technology to aid him in his search for a crater. He narrowed down his area of interest to a series of small lakes near the epicenter of the explosion. Interessant ist, dass Herr Kulik tatsächlich einige Seen während seiner Forschungsexpedition aufwendig entwässern ließ um deren Grund zu untersuchen, weil er bei diesen Seen gedacht hatte, es handelt sich um einen Krater. Man fand dort Baumwurzeln, die noch vor kurzem gelebt haben müssen. Und die waren am Grund des Sees. Wie können die dort hingekommen sein? Wäre es ein Meteoriteneinschlag, wären die zerstört gewesen. Kulik hat auch sofort begriffen, dass es sich um keinen Meteoritenkrater handeln konnte. Er war enttäuscht. Maybe Kulik didn't know what he'd found that he'd seen the root of the problem. Kulik wanted to continue exploring until he had the solution, but he never got the chance. When the Germans invaded Russia in 1941, Kulik volunteered for the Red Army. He died a prisoner of the Germans a year later. And after the war, the focus changed. The world had seen the atom bomb, Tunguska had a new meaning for scientists and a new place in the science fiction boom. Apart from real science, nearly 40 novels have been inspired by the Tunguska disaster. One became Andrei Tarkovsky's cinema masterpiece, Stalker. There's a meteorite opera from Germany. And this is Russia's top-selling M1 Tunguska anti-aircraft missile tank. If you can't afford a tank, for just $50 you can have another kind of blast, Tunguska Blast, an energy drink made in Florida with, they claim, herbs from Tunguska. Maybe those secret ingredients are radioactive. This is a virtual Tunguska computer game, and it's pretty authentic. It even starts on the Trans-Siberian Express. Just like geologist Christoph Brenneisen's expedition. 
Everything about Tunguska is extreme. The temperature varies between minus 40 Celsius in winter and plus 35 in summer. And it's seriously isolated. The Trans-Siberian Express passes more than 700 kilometers away from Vanavara, the nearest town to the explosion. So the next stage is by plane. This is the last bit of comfort Christoph will enjoy for quite a while. Vanavara is the only place to stock up on provisions and find the people to take you safely to the middle of the wilderness. Back in 1908, Vanavara was a bustling fur trading post. Conditions in the taiga, the Siberian forest, were perfect for bears, squirrels, reindeer and wolves. The local event shared the hunting with adventurers from every part of the Russian Empire. This was a country for hardy people, people who didn't mind roughing it. Even in today's Vanavara, there's still a link to the events of 1908. You know, But for one group, the experience of the blast was even worse. These were the Evenk, the nomadic reindeer herders, the original people of Tunguska. Мой как бы прадед получается. Он был свидетелем этого дела. Он в этом на Кимче был как раз. Его уехал. Хорошо уехал. Если бы он он не уехал, там очень при этом не знаю, что там было, вот этом взрыве, очень много было гибели людей, тунгусов, там целыми родами. Вот каждый, каждая речка в Чамбу впадает, там жили эти, вот, допустим, мой род, там, другой род, третий. И когда он упал, он их, вот это все, типа как ядерный взрыв там был, бывает, вот это, все смел, все, все погибли. But the Evenk have another explanation. A shaman begged Agdi, their thunder god, to destroy an enemy tribe. Furious at being misused, Agdi sent iron birds against the Evenk, shooting lightning bolts that split the earth. This place is still taboo for the Evenk. Or was it another kind of lightning bolt? Theory 17, the Tesla experiment. The famous or notorious scientist Nikola Tesla is working on a giant transformer in Wardenclyffe, New York. While attempting to demonstrate the unbelievable power of his artificial light beam, he makes a colossal error, which Tunguska has to pay for. At last, Christoph is taking a Mi-8 long-haul helicopter with the warden of the Tunguska Nature Reserve to the epicenter of the explosion. Vanavara, the village that was almost wiped off the map in 1908, is flourishing again. Today, more than 3,000 people live here as hunters, woodworkers, or administering the reserve. A bird's eye view of Tunguska, a completely uninhabited region. From this perspective, the difficulty of the terrain is clear to see. 
Now in mid-May, when the snow starts to melt, these endless swamps are especially difficult to cross. A group of scientists, craftsmen and hunters with their dogs are dropped off at one of the nature reserve's lodges. Christoph flies on with two guides towards the center of the impact zone. And here they find Leonid Kulik's hut on the edge of a vast swamp. The pioneering Tunguska scientist was here 80 years ago. Since then, many more have used it as their base camp. The roof of Kulik's main hut has fallen in, but inside, the spirit of the pioneer still lingers. Leonid Kulik may in fact have got closer than he thought to finding evidence of the origins of the blast at Tunguska. But for the Soviet scientists who followed him, everything changed with the detonation of the first atom bomb. After the Second World War, Soviet scientists poured into Tunguska. They were urgently searching for a new kind of evidence, radioactivity or antimatter. They used powerful magnets to look for fragments of extraterrestrial metals. They did find particles that could have come from outer space, but they couldn't find any definitive cause for the Tunguska disaster. Maybe the crazy theorists had a better idea for these new times. Theory 43, the time-traveling A-bomb. In the 1970s, a lonely A-bomb got lost. It fell into a time warp and popped out again in distant Tunguska, exploding in 1908 with a pretty respectable bang. But when a real meteorite crashed into another part of Siberia in 1947, everything got more complicated. Because here, they found the crater and parts of the meteorite right away. In Tunguska, it remained defiantly difficult. The scientists had to dig to find out more. But when the ground wasn't frozen hard, the summer marshes, with their millions of mosquitoes, made digging almost impossible and unbearable. And yet, soil samples had to be taken in the interests of the Soviet state, however hard the job. and soil samples continue to be the main research tool today. If there's no cosmic dust on the surface, maybe it can be found in deeper layers, 40 to 60 centimeters down, ground zero in 1908. This is what Christoph Brenneisen is looking for. He's here in the month of May, in the brief period between the ice and the bogs. He hopes that what he's wrapping in his plastic bags is buried matter from outer space. There's one other center of interest for the location of the elusive crater. After the war, attention narrowed again, as it had in Kulik's time, to the lakes that could be candidates for a crater. Here at Lake Cheko, scientists have constantly taken measurements in the water and in the sediments of the lake bed. This led to a new theory from far away Italy. The research group led by Professor Giuseppe Longo at the University of Bologna is now concentrating solely on this lake. Back in 1991, they were the first Western scientists allowed to investigate the impact area. And they have important new ideas about the explosion. 
che l'evento di Tunguska sia dovuto all'esplosione in atmosfera o di un meteorite roccioso o di una cometa. Questo spiegherebbe il motivo per cui, eh, essendosi interamente disintegrato nell'atmosfera, non si sono trovati frammenti del corpo cosmico sul terreno. Ma they believe the bigger fragments must still have left some craters. They've spent years looking for matter from space. Now, Giuseppe Longo, fellow physicist Romano Serra and marine geologist Luca Gasparini are determined to solve the mystery once and for all. They're extremely well equipped. They've already sent divers down to examine the sediment of Lake Ceco because they're convinced that this is where they will find the final answer to the question, was Tunguska devastated by a meteorite? The shape of the lake seems to confirm their hypothesis. On one side, uh, with our seismic, we saw a lot of sediments. So we were on, I mean, we, we, we agreed uh, with the previous theory that the lake was very old, but on the other side, the shape of the lake is very unusual. It is a funnel, funnel-like shape, uh, an inverted cone, 50 meter by 350 meter. So it is not usual for a um, Siberian lake with our thermocast lake, uh, very flat uh, bottom with a couple of meter maximum depth. This is an aerial shot of the Cecco Lake taken during the annual spring floods. At first, the Italian scientists only looked at microparticles from the lake. But over time, they've developed a model of this entire body of water that looks remarkably like an impact crater. Now they're planning to drill in the lake bed more than 50 meters down. They're confident they'll find something. In the bottom, and this is very important, close to the center, about 10 meters below the bottom, we, found, we find a density anomaly, which is very clear from our seismic data. And this density anomaly could be well related to an overpressure related to the impactor or the impactor itself, which is now buried below 10 meters of sediment. Today, Luca Gasparini and his colleagues judge that this lake is only a hundred years old. Only a new expedition can prove whether this half-frozen lake does hold the key to the mystery. Meanwhile, Christoph Brenneisen is starting to have his doubts about the meteorite theory. So far, all his soil tests have been negative. He has found no trace of an object from space. Now he's moving to a new location in the south of the Tunguska Reserve. Because something has been found here that has set Tunguska researchers buzzing. It could be powerful evidence for a quite different theory. Crossing bogland still covered in ice, Christoph reaches the John Stone. It was discovered by John Anfinogenov in 1972. Christoph is certain that this rock doesn't belong here. Its coarse crystalline structure could only have been formed deep underground. There's no connection with the basalt found hereabouts. Ein solcher Stein kann hier vielleicht als Findling herkommen, wie man das aus Norddeutschland kennt. Aber wir müssen berücksichtigen, dass es hier überhaupt gar keine Vergletscherung in der klassischen Art wie in Deutschland gegeben hat. Dieser Stein muss hier hin befördert worden sein durch eine große Explosion. No one's sure where it comes from, but it's not from outer space. And perhaps this man has the explanation. Wolfgang Kunt is an astrophysicist. He lives in Western Germany in the volcanic landscape called the Eiffel. A few years ago, he came up with a daring hypothesis that turned the Tunguska debate on its head. He believes that the John Stone is evidence of an earthbound cause for the Tunguska blast. Kunt has abandoned his own field of astrophysics to commit himself to the volcano theory. Als ich dort ging, hab, kam mir eins augenblicks die Idee, das ist doch wie in meiner Eifel. Es sind viele kleine Teiche, es sind auch Trockengebiete, trocken sind Moore, wo man tief einsackt, wie die Trockenmare in der Eifel. Und im Grunde überzeugte mich 
vor Ort die Landschaft sofort, dass es sich um ein vulkanisches Gebiet handelt. Kunst Theory is based on the volcanic origins of the Tunguska region. He believes that a hundred years ago, molten gases were expelled through volcanic funnels from deep inside the earth. A look at a cross section of the earth explains it. Outside the solid inner core is the outer core, a layer of molten magma and gases. Kunt believes that superheated magma and gases forced their way through the Earth's mantle via subterranean volcanoes. For thousands of years, these ascending columns of magma were held back by a thick layer of basalt. But in June 1908, under immense pressure, the gas burst through several kilometers of solid basalt rock. The molten magma remained beneath the basalt, and only the gas streamed upwards. A colossal gas storm raged over the Tunguska region. Traveling faster than the speed of sound, the gas reached a height of 200 kilometers. The static electricity that resulted ignited the explosive mix of methane and oxygen. Das war nicht ein Ereignis, sondern das war ein Sturm von der Dauer von äh, etwa einer Viertelstunde. Also es hat sich da keinesfalls um nur ein Ereignis gehandelt, sondern alle Augenzeugen berichten eindeutig, dass es sich um mehrere laute Ereignisse nacheinander gehandelt hat und dass das ganze Phänomen sich bis zu einer Stunde erstreckt hat. The fact that the event lasted an hour is a serious argument against the meteorite theory. Christoph Brenneisen is now on the track of evidence that could support Wolfgang Kunz's gas explosion theory. He's looking for remains of trees from the disaster year of 1908. There are only a few left in the thick tiger forests, but they provide important information. And they could explain something Kulik noticed 70 years before Professor Wolfgang Kunt aus Bonn hat eine Theorie entwickelt, quasi hat von unten eine Gasblase äh, das Waldgebiet und das Moor nach oben durchschlagen, sodass diese Baumwurzeln über hunderte Meter durch die Gegend geschleudert wurden und abgeregnet sind. In diesem Bereich gibt es ja mehrere dieser Relikte. Es ist eindeutig die Explosionskatastrophe. Man sieht es da vorne am Stamm sind ja noch Verkohlungsreste. Während sämtliche Bäume hier rum, die zwar zum großen Teil jünger sind, aber auf jeden Fall keine Waldbrandschäden tragen. Und so gesehen ist das Ganze ein Fremdling. Could this explain the roots Kulix men found in the lakes all those years ago? Mühlau Castle in eastern Germany. This unlikely place houses the world's only remaining Tunguska Museum. Gottlieb Polzer, physicist and passionate hunter, is its founder. He organized the first Russo-German expedition to Tunguska. He shares part of Kunz's idea, but he takes it further. I vertrete auch die Auffassung, dass dort eine Gasexplosion gewesen sein muss, aber nicht nur. Es ist naheliegend, eine Variante anzunehmen, dass es ein Kometenkörper war mit mindestens zwei Kernen, dass dieser beim Eintritt und bei der Annäherung an die Erde, in die Erdatmosphäre, die Kerne aufeinander geprallt sind. There was an explosion, which unleashed a chain reaction. Perhaps, Pulsar believes, underground gases were released as a result of the impact and were ignited. I glaube, dass dann auch unterschiedliche äh, Prozesse erfolgt sind. Zum Beispiel gibt es eine Vorstellung, äh, dass da eine Mückenexplosion stattgefunden haben soll. Yes, you heard that right. A mosquito explosion. In spite of years of research, we haven't heard anything else about a mosquito explosion. But then why not? After all, there are 120 other theories about the Tunguska blast. Theory 79, the black hole. 
A plucky little black hole decided to flex its muscles and chose Tunguska for the exercise. With an enormous impact, it thudded into Tunguska, bored through the earth, and emerged on the other side, disappearing proud but unacknowledged in deep space. And genuine scientists seem to share some extreme theories. Yuri Lavbin used to run the Tunguska Museum in the Siberian city of Krasnoyarsk until he ran out of money and someone stole his two-ton meteorite, he says. Now he only has little specimens, but he makes big announcements about Tunguska that always manage to attract the headlines. Взорвал техногенный объект. Техногенный объект. Почему? Потому что мы нашли космическую съемку. Космическую съемку обнаружили. Вот. Вот фактические разрушения. Вот они. Таких разрушений на Южном болоте в Адванаваре нет. И не было никогда. Вот эти разрушения все показывают. А вот это старт техногенного объекта, который был размером около 25 квадратных километров. Он развернулся, пошел на основную комету и ее взорвал. Но сам погиб. Сам погиб. Почему? Потому что здесь, здесь, когда основное тело кометы шло в этом направлении, и если бы комета приблизилась к Земле, такая миллиарды тонн приблизилась, то она бы начала э, по Земле царапать. И вот эта вся грязь взлетела бы туда, в атмосферу. Атмосфера бы, так сказать, погасла, солнышко закрылось, и мы бы с вами, возможно, не родились. Close to the takeoff point of the UFO, Lavbin has found a small piece of the spacecraft, a clump of ferrosilicon, he says. If we accept this archaeologist's theory, an alien power sacrificed itself for humanity. A gigantic spaceship and its heroic crew saved us from the killer comet. Yuri Lavbeans is not the only extraterrestrial theory. Theory 92. A message from outer space? In 1883, the volcano of Krakatoa erupted. Aliens in the Swan constellation saw the columns of smoke and took them as a pathetic attempt to get in contact. They replied with an enthusiastic laser beam that made Earth fall in Tunguska. Unfortunately, humanity failed to understand this powerful message. Back to the present, where more and more expeditions are setting off for the region of the explosion. Maybe it has something to do with the beauty of the landscape. Or maybe it's the fact that humans like solving mysteries. This archive footage was shot in summer. Brenneisen's expedition is taking place in May. In spring, some of the rivers are nearly impassable. The Churim Waterfall. It's accessible in this 1950s summer. For Christoph's group, it's a formidable barrier. There's no perfect season for exploring the tiger. Summer brings new dangers, like some very poisonous snakes. Near Churim waterfall, Geologist Valentina Bikova shows her German colleague more remains from the year 1908. Deep in the Tunguska forests, you can still find a few carbonized tree stumps still standing from the 1908 explosion. That evening, Valentina and Christoph examined their freshly gathered samples of soil, stones and moss. Though Christoph may be becoming a skeptic, 
Valentina still believes that the explosion was caused by a meteorite. She's convinced it's just a matter of time before scientists find the cosmic dust that will be proof. And she certainly knows about other strange phenomena near this camp at Pristan. There are many examples of strange phenomena in Tunguska, but a lot of them can be explained. Christoph Brenneisen is on his way to the highest point in the impact area. Something strange happens here, too. We are here at a very interesting spot, the 519-meter-high Mount Farrington, which brings the compass to the compass. The north will go to the south, the east will go to the west. Man kann sich nicht auf GPS und Kompass verlassen. The phenomenon of the crazy compass turns out to be not so mysterious after all. The stone on the mountain is simply highly magnetic. This geological phenomenon is also seen in other parts of the world. And yet Mount Farrington is one of those places at the epicenter of the explosion that has attracted scientists for decades. And maybe that's partly because of the fantastic views it offers of one of the most remarkable places on Earth. But of course, the scientists don't really come here for such romantic reasons. People have long said that plants and trees grow exceptionally fast here. And according to local people, the soil of Tunguska is an extremely effective fertilizer. But there's more. Soviet scientists in the atomic age took up a new study. They became interested in studying the mutations in flora and fauna in the Tunguska region. In the 50s, they discovered that the trees had broader annual rings since the year 1908 than in the years before the explosion. And Christoph himself has even discovered a genetic mutation in the growth of pine needles. I have here nadeln der sogenannten Pristan Kiefer, die in der Regel immer in einer geraden Nadelzahl herauswachsen, also zwei, vier, aber nicht was Sie hier sehen, zum Beispiel fünf oder auch drei. Es wird also eine ganze Menge hier zu untersuchen geben. Alleine die Magnetstürme, die man hier beobachten kann und die unsere Kompasse und GPS so vorübergehend außer Kraft setzen, können bereits eine Mutation auslösen. Selbstverständlich gibt es Mutationen auch immer unter Naturstressverfahren, sprich zu wenig Nährstoffangebot, Feuchtigkeit, Kälte etc. Aber die Mutationen häufen sich hier so extrem in der Region des Evenkenlandes, dass man auch schon an andere Ursachen denken kann. Mutations and increased growth can also be seen after an atomic explosion or radioactive contamination. So Soviet scientists measured their tree rings, burned them and analyzed the ashes. They couldn't find any clear evidence of a nuclear explosion or large-scale radioactive damage. But that has not discouraged the nuclear disaster fans among the Tunguska theorists. Theory 21. Atom bomb test. Europe at the beginning of the 20th century. It started with a secret military collaboration between the Russian Tsar and his cousin, the Prussian Kaiser. They would develop an enormously powerful atom bomb. Unfortunately, the bomb's developers, together with their blueprints in the whole of Tunguska, went up in the very first test explosion. And the emperors were soon in no position to commission any further experiments. 
Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico, is a weapons research center. Here, Mark Boslow has developed the most sophisticated of all models to explain the Tunguska phenomenon. He believes he can answer the question once and for all. The Tunguska explosion, I think, was caused by the impact of a large comet or asteroid with the atmosphere. Um, it came into the atmosphere, it broke apart, it exploded before it hit the ground, and the explosion generated a lot of light and a lot of heat, and it generated a strong blast wave that created winds at the surface that were so strong that they blew down trees, and the heat uh, ignited some of these trees and created a fire. Um, so I think the Tunguska event is fully explainable in terms of the impact of an asteroid or comet. Mark Boslow's model of a meteorite explosion at an altitude of 5 to 10 kilometers is not new. What is new is that Boslow can test it with a state-of-the-art computer simulation without leaving the lab. I think the reason there was no crater, uh, no obvious crater, was because the comet or asteroid expended all its energy and exploded at high altitude. So there was really nothing left to hit the ground. Um, crater forming impacts require that something solid actually collide with the ground. Um, it doesn't appear that that happened in the case of Tunguska. So there's no crater to be seen, but according to Boslow, there's no need for a crater. What scientists did see was knocked over trees. Kulik's archive photos and film provide a great deal of information. They've inspired generations of scientists to use the pattern of tree collapse to establish the exact position of the explosion. In the 1950s, models were tested in a pressure chamber. This model clearly shows an area in the middle of the blast where the trees remained standing, an extremely convincing argument for no crater. And Mark Boslow has fed this data too into his computer. Here is a mid-air explosion seen from the side with its blast wave. You can clearly see how it spares the trees immediately below. Our simulations show a very strong blast wave coming, coming down from the sky, and it's, it's radiating from a, a place in the sky, and as that blast wave hits the ground, there's a component of very high wind blowing radially outward from, from the center, from ground zero, and so that's the direction that the trees blow down. So they're basically laying down in a radial pattern uh, directed away from ground zero. And that would explain a strange phenomenon, why some of the trees remained standing. They were right underneath the explosion, stripped of their branches, but still there. And to provide the final explanation, a scientist must also take into account the strange light phenomena connected to Tunguska. From Moscow to London, for three nights after the 30th of June, people could read their newspapers outside at midnight. A hundred years on, we know that a giant dust cloud from Tunguska was carried by the east winds of the thermosphere across Europe, reflecting the sun's light back down to Earth. Mark Boslow sees this phenomenon as further support for his meteorite theory. He believes his computer model can explain that too, using information from the other side of the solar system. We modeled the impact of Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter, the comet that collided with Jupiter in 1994. And one of the outcomes of our model was a giant ballistic plume that was ejected into space. And that plume rose to a very high altitude, something like 3,000 kilometers, and then collapsed on top of Jupiter's atmosphere. And it had a lot of dust and material in it that reflected sunlight. And we think a very similar phenomenon occurred at Tunguska.
but astrophysicist Wolfgang Kunt doubts that a meteorite explosion could cause three nights as bright as day across all Europe. He believes this phenomenon can only be explained by light volcanic gases. Dazu braucht man Streuer in der Hochatmosphäre, wo kein Kometenstaub sich hält und auch kein Asteroidenstaub. Das, da halten sich leichte Eiskristalle, so wie sie uns jetzt gerade hier um die Köpfe wehen. Die können von Wasserstoff und mit, mit Heliumgas, Methangas hochgetragen. Die können sich dort oben einige Tage halten. Whichever piece of evidence you examine under the microscope, the supporters of the meteorite theory will claim it for themselves. And so will Wolfgang Kunt for his underground gas theory. Incidentally, the meteorite people are clearly in the majority. And the team from Bologna are facing their moment of truth. They plan to test their theory right there on location. You can easily test it. I mean, you go there, you dig, and you find <laughs> yes or no, is a meteorite or not. If it had fallen on the earth, one of them нашли бы столько экспедиций было ученых там я думаю он просто земля его оттолкнула она же круглая да и тогда была очень здоровая не как сейчас я имею в виду она его оттолкнула а вот сзади за идет ударная эта волна ein Ausbruch aus dem Erdinnern ein vulkanischer das ist äh, mir scheint die einzige Lösung die mit den vielen Fakten verträglich ist die wir sehen but for some, like Benny Pizer, that's not really the point. Regardless of what actually happened in Tunguska, even if it wasn't an asteroid, asteroids actually exist. And asteroids actually hit the Earth and actually explode in the atmosphere. We observe asteroids exploding in the atmosphere all the time. If it does collide with the Earth, it's probably going to be over the ocean or over an uninhabited place. Um, there are so many other natural disasters, such as hurricanes, volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunami, and so forth, that have a much, much higher rate of, and, and a much, much higher probability of happening and creating catastrophes. And so, in a relative sense, these aren't something that we should really spend a lot of time worrying about. But Mark Boslow has never been to Tunguska. When you have, like Christoph Brenneisen, it doesn't let you go. And luckily for him, there's no sign of a solution soon. Ich bin hergekommen als Anhänger der Kometentheorie und ich musste mich hier eines Besseren belehren lassen. Ich habe keine Antwort. Die Wissenschaft hat auch keine Antwort. Es gibt Modebewegungen, mal ist es ein Meteorit, mal ist es ein Komet, mal ist es eine erdgebundene endogene Ursache. Ich habe das Rätsel nicht lösen können und ich glaube, es wird die nächsten Jahrzehnte auch kein anderer schaffen. Even after a hundred years, debate about the Tunguska disaster shows no sign of slowing. In fact, it's getting livelier than ever, and Tunguska is getting ready for still more expeditions. Whether they'll find anything remains to be seen. And so for the time being, the Tunguska legend lives on. That's what legends are for.